je travaille au CERN, je suis israélienne, euh, j'habite à Saint-Genis, j'habite à Saint-Genis, parce que je crossing the border um, de la Suisse à la French side très um, souvent. So, luckily for you and me, um, we're going to have this talk in English, and I can make the, uh, the most, um, um, the, the, these are jokes that we do not usually make because they're dull, but since you are, I hope, fresh in the field of dark matter, um, you see dark matter, dark matter, huh? it's very, uh, yeah, so uh, um, if you haven't heard that before, then uh, yeah. Don't, don't tell, it's me, because I'll be lame. So, um, dark matter is everywhere, and as I'll tell you soon, it's here. Quite a lot of it. It's uh, flying through this uh, uh, room as we speak, and its presence is probably so important for our being, because otherwise this uh, um, nice galaxy that uh, Darth Vader is, is holding magically, so actually it's not Darth Vader that's holding this uh, uh, galaxy, it's the dark matter that's holding this galaxy. And I'll uh, show you in a couple of slides that without dark matter, this galaxy and us, everything else um, couldn't have been. So, um, dark matter, so there's dark matter, what, what's the other type of matter? So, dark matter, and all the rest is called? Ordinary matter, dark and ordinary, or boring and not boring. So, so what, what is ordinary matter? What, what, what? What are we made of? Parts. You go to your uh, chemistry or biology or your uh, physics class, what do you remember? Proton. Atoms, molecules, protons, what else? Electron. Electrons, neutrons, all, all that stuff, very good, you did well. All that stuff, what we learned uh, um, in uh, school or university, um, molecules, atoms, quarks that make uh, the proton and the neutron, their subatomic uh, elementary particle. These are all the ordinary matter that makes us and the galaxy and everything else that is in the universe. But in fact, as you probably um, um, remember, there's many, many, many other particles in the world. Um, this is the uh, standard model table. These are all the particles that are known to physicists. Um, it's the most successful model in physics, period. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. This is the only model uh, um, in physics that had a huge success, and we now know that we have quarks, we have uh, um, electron, we have a muon, which is like the electron on the heavier, and tau, and we have the neutrinos, and we have uh, bosons, and these are all the matter that we have in our models. So when I say ordinary matter, I also talk about what's in this uh, table, even though it does not um, make us. So I told you there's dark matter. You know there's dark matter, right? Because you're here. And there's ordinary matter. How much ordinary matter we have? How much dark matter do we have? It's amazing. So we believe nowadays that ordinary matter is only 15% of all the matter in the universe. So the atoms, the uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, everything we see, all the galaxies, the sun, all the planets, they're only 15% of the matter in the universe. That's amazing. That's, that's not a lot, 15%, right? What's, what's the other 85%? We don't know. We do not know what it is. We have many theories. We'll talk today about some of them. We don't know what it is, but we know it does not emit light or any sort of electromagnetic radiation. So if it does not emit light, it's dark. Therefore, we can call it dark matter. So dark matter is just a general name 
to something that we do not know and that should account for a series of uh, um, phenomena that we'll talk about today. Uh, there are many theories. Um, there are even theories that claim that there is no dark matter and, and um, say there is some sort of change to the physics law. Um, so dark matter is, is, is many things, but some models are nicer than the others. Okay, so the mystery of the missing mass, it's, it's, it's very dramatic. Astrophysics is a very dramatic field. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, um, three things. We'll start with a couple of words on astronomy. We'll talk on uh, pizza. And uh, multi-messenger astronomy. Have you heard multi-messenger astronomy? Have you heard this, this term before? Come on, yes, no, maybe, no? Okay, thanks. And uh, we'll talk about the limitation of not pizza, but of the multi-messenger astronomy. And then we'll talk why we think that 85% of the matter in the universe is, is unknown, because that's a pretty strong claim. I'll have to uh, uh, prove it to you. And finally, um, if we'll have time, we'll talk about how we look for something that you don't know what it is and you cannot see. That's a big challenge. And the answer for the last one is uh, um, we are building some, some pretty amazing detectors. So uh, yeah, let's talk about astronomy. So what do astronomers do, astrophysicists do? They do observation, right? You look at stuff. So let's, let's break the observation process to several parts. So first of all, we need a source. We need something to observe. Uh, and we need a detector, something to measure it with or detect it with. So uh, do you all see this, this nice red uh, light? There, just above the uh, near the screen. Yes. Okay. So let's say that this is our source, and uh, uh, what what is the detector in this uh, silly example? Our eyes. Our eyes. Okay. So we have a source. We have a detector. Is this enough? No. We actually need something that comes from the source to our detector, and the word we actually use in physics is messenger. So the same way as uh, um, the pizza delivery guy is, I pronounce the pizza, the pizza delivery guys bring you pizza, the messenger particle brings you information. And it's actually, I want you to think about something that is moving from one place to the other, because this is the messenger, this is what happens. Is it uh, uh, enough for the messenger to arrive to the detector? No. What else needs to happen? I think that 85% of the question I'll ask you, the, the answer will be on, 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 the, uh, on the screen. And I put a lot of effort into this uh, um, PowerPoint graphic, so, so halfway, please. OK, so we need it to interact with the detector. Because I told you there, there's probably a lot of dark matter particles here. Okay? And they're passing through our detector. Do you see them? No, why not? Because they do not interact with your eye, with your detector. So we have a source. This source emits some sort of a messenger, a particle, that flies and reach the detector and makes some interaction. And then we can do the data analysis and, and publish papers and uh, get tenure tracks, etc. Et OK, so let's assume we're not looking at this red light. By the way, in this red light case, what, what, what is the messenger? A photon. What sort of photon is a particle of light? What sort of photon? In what color? Red. red. A red photon. But let's assume we're doing observation of, on the sun. So the sun is the source. Um, we can use again the photon as a messenger, as the light particle. We use our eyes or some sort of a telescope as a detector. And finally, we do data analysis either in our brains or a computer, and, and we know if we need to take an umbrella. And here's a, a, a nice guy. Let's call him uh, Shmulik. Shmulik. Do we have Shmulik here? OK, I'm, I'm fine. So here's Shmulik doing an observation of the universe. He has a very fancy telescope, and he's collecting messengers from space. In, in this case, it's uh, uh, photons. And using this messenger, he can make an image of whatever he sees. In this case, it's a pretty uh, nebula. So far, everything is great. 
Now a question for you. This is the 15% that I do not tell you the answer right away. Photons are easy to block, right or wrong? Yes. Yeah. Right. Right? Yes. Wrong. Yes. Wrong? Right. 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 Okay. Anyone thinks wrong? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Some right, some wrong. So everyone, please raise your hands. Right. Raise your hands. Put them on your eyes. What do you see? What do you see? Nothing. Nothing. Why, why do you see nothing? Because you're blocked. The photons. So photons are, are relatively easy to block, right? It's, it's a very silly experiment. And this is very bad for Shmulik because, for example, there are clouds. And he cannot do uh, astronomy when, when there are clouds. But is clouds the only thing that can block uh, the photons? Let's assume with, with clouds we have a, a pretty fancy solution. We, we uh, go into uh, space. But what else can block photons? Is the space empty? No, the space is full with uh, matter and radiation, and photons cannot travel very long in space. Now, some people I, I, I heard like people starting to complain, oh, what you're talking about is not right, photons are not necessarily easy to stop, and you're right. Because I have here a, a, a case, I'm, I'm trying to sell you something, and I told you only half of the truth. Because optical photons are very easy to block, right? You just do this. What, what do you need in order to block X-ray photons? Yeah, you, you probably went and did some uh, X-ray or, uh, I don't know, and they gave you this lead jacket. Because in order to stop a photon in the X-ray wavelength, one centimeter of hand is not enough. You need one centimeter of lead. So even those photons, they're harder to stop than the, the optical ones, but still it's possible. The same for all um, the photons through the entire um, electromagnetic spectrum, as you can see here. So what, what you have here is the full electromagnetic spectrum. It starts in the short wavelength with the more energetic photons, the gamma ray and the X-ray. It goes through the visible light, infrared, radio wave, and uh, yeah, that's where it ends. So, but, but by the way, what, what type of photons are the hardest to stop? So, people, th this is a nice trivia question. You can uh, tease your friends. Actually, can, can you see what's going on outside right now with your eyes? I hope not, right? But if you'll take out your cell phone, would it work in this room? Yeah. What kind of radiation cell phones work? with? It's a radio wave, a gigahertz waves, right? So these are very long wavelengths, and these wavelengths are the hardest to stop. Why they're hardest to stop? Because they have very low energy and they can kind of sneak in through stuff. And in fact, the, the messenger we have the most information from about the universe, the far away uh, universe, is radio. So radio waves can, uh, uh, with them we can look very, very far into the universe. However, radio waves are low energy. And I need more energetic uh, phenomena. So, so in the research I do, radio waves do not uh, help me very much. So, so what you see here is what kind of electromagnetic radiations. These are all photons. You can uh, measure on, um, on the surface of Earth and which one you need to uh, go into space. And in the last um, um, 50, 60 years, there's been a huge boost of telescopes. Some are on the surface, some are on high mountains, some are on space, and they give us a great, great view of the universe in many, many uh, wavelengths. And here you see some of, uh, um, uh, some of the uh, electromagnetic or photon detectors or telescopes. So we have a, a view, a very wide view of the universe. Why, why, why is it good for us? If you go for the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, my hand hurts, um, uh, she will send you to do some sort of uh, medical examination, either MRI or x-ray or uh, 
infrared or she will examine the, the hand by her eyes, etc., etc. I have no idea in, 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 uh, in uh, um, medical, but there are a bunch of tests you can do. And from each test you learn different things about your hand. The same is in astronomy. So this is just a, a M33, the pinwheel galaxy, just a random galaxy I pulled out of uh, um, Google. And this is how it looks like um, in visible light. However, if I do a multi-messenger astronomy, I can get different views. And these are all views of the same galaxy taken by different um, telescopes. So you see there an X-ray and uh, ultraviolet, radio, mid-infrared, visible, and another visible in a better resolution. And, and you can see that they look different. For example, this is a, a spiral galaxy. So you only see the spiral thingies in the UV and in the visible. This is because the spiral is where new stars are made, and, and this process is related to UV emission. So this can tell us information about early or young stars in the galaxy. Uh, radio waves will give us information about the X-ray, that's the, the red thing. It's, it's not really red, that's just the uh, imaging. Um, but this gives us information about um, um, yeah, radio waves and X-ray, etc., etc. And by combining this information, you get a full or almost a full uh, set of information of what you're looking at and we've had a great leap in uh, the last 20 years in, in doing that we know so much more um, now however i told you remember standard model quarks neutrinos blah 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 why only use photons why do we have so many particles huh so that's a great question thank you for asking um i'll just briefly tell you about um the ice cube experiment, which is buried uh, one and a half kilometer, between one and a half and two and a half kilometer, kilometers, huh? in the uh, ice under the South Pole. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to talk about uh, uh, this amazing uh, experiment and about neutrino astronomy. Uh, but I think in two weeks I'm doing Madala Bao on, on ice cube and neutrino astronomy. So uh, um, if you want to hear, then. Uh, either Google it or uh, we'll meet in two weeks. So there is uh, astronomy using other particles, but it's not as uh, advanced as photons. So to summarize this, this part, right now our main source of information about celestial bodies is light or electromagnetic radiation. We build and operate great telescopes and we have made uh, great discoveries but unfortunately, we are still uh, practically blind. We do not see the whole cosmos in all energy range. A lot of things are still unknown, and we do not have a full view of everything. And just as an illustration about how this can be, a, um, how this can happen. So this is a, a image Earth as seen by night light, an image that was made by NASA. And this is basically Earth, and all, all the lights are night lights. Um, and here you can easily see that there are very, some very good real estate places that you can um, settle down in. For example, oops, uh, here, do you see this black point there on, on the uh, right arrow? Do you recognize this dark place? Just above the, North the lit place? North Korea. North Korea, yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> North Korea is dark at night. And uh, Africa is pretty empty as well, right? There's no light there. Does it mean it's empty? No, actually, in many cases, it's uh, uh, the other way around. So, so how come it's, uh, um, it's black? There are no people in uh, North Korea or Africa? This is actually the uh, Earth population distribution, the actual one. So consider not looking the same. So, so why isn't this electromagnetic survey of Earth is good enough to check the population? Because there are other sort of signature that people make, except uh, light. And this is 
the same as the dark matter mystery. Right now we look at space using this. Some part we see, some part we do not see. Do we know what we do not see? No. But we have different ways to kind of trick and, and guess what we are missing. So now uh, we'll move to the second part, why we think that 85% of the universe is uh, uh, missing. And the answer is that there are many measurements on different levels that lead us to the same point. There's a lot of mass that is missing. Maybe there's a different explanation. Today I'm not aware of any theory that can explain all of these effects. Maybe if you'll come up with one, that, that would be great. But uh, there are quite a lot of uh, um, evidence. So I'll talk, I'll, there are several, I'll, I'll mention three or four here today. I'll give you more details on the first one. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so, so let's go into the, the details. So, so how do you weigh a galaxy? I need a big, pretty big scale. And one of the method is rotation curves. What is a rotation curve? This is, uh, uh, I'll take another step backward. This is the sun, and this is Earth. And you know that Earth, uh, the sun is pulling Earth, right? So, so how come we do not fall down? How, how come if, if Earth is, is, if the sun is pulling us, how come we're still here? How come the moon is not collapsing on Earth? Because Earth is moving. Right. The reason is that Earth or the moon are moving. If they would have been at rest, then we would crash. Now, if you remember your uh, uh, high school physics, there's this uh, um, uh, force equation, Newtonian um, gravity and uh, centrifugal force, and they have to be equal. And when things are right on, we have this very nice satellite uh, movement. What will happen if we move too slow? Look, we'll fall down. That's a, that's a pity. Something happens to satellite. It's very funny when it's not your satellite. What will happen if we'll move too fast? We'll fly into space. Now, this velocity we need to be at in order to be in the right place and not, and not fall down. It depends on the mass of the sun, and it depends on how far away we are from the sun. And these are all things that we can measure. So if we do this trick um, on the solar system, for example, we know the mass of the sun, we know how far away the planets are, we can use the equation I just showed you and, and plot the velocity of the different planets as a function of how far away they are from the sun. So the further we go out, further we are away from the sun, the planet velocity is decreasing. And you can see Pluto there is uh, uh, pretty slow and Mercury is, uh, is uh, boosting very fast. And this curve is called the rotation curve. It gives us the velocity of a system, in this, in this case a solar system, as a function of how far we are from its center. Now, we can also play the, uh, the opposite game, right? I can tell you what is the uh, velocities of the planets and you can tell me the mass of the sun. Because it's all, it's, it's simple physics. And this also works. So these relations are very, very um, um, basic and, and they work and, and this is what we use to, um, to do uh, astrophysics and to fly satellites. Let's take a step forward. Now we're not talking about the solar system, we're talking about a galaxy. So we have many, many, many planets. And uh, these planets, like our sun, they're circulating the galactic center, the same way that we uh, circulate the sun. Now, the galaxy is huge. We don't only have a few um, planets in it. Uh, um, a few uh, yeah, planets uh, in it. We have 
a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. So most of the stuff, it's, uh, it's so hot here with the projector. Okay, so most of the stuff is in the center, is in the center of the galaxy, right here, the red circle. Or here is, a, um, if you look at it from the side. So all of the stuff, most of the stuff is here, and this is the visible range of the galaxy. And as you go further out, you move to here, you still have stars in it, but much, much less, and you have less mass. So you can imagine that as we go out here, we have more and more mass that is pulling us. And as we get to the red line, this mass is more or less constant. So what do you think will happen to the uh, um, rotation curve? It will look something like this. As we move in the red circle from the center of the galaxy outside, as we go out, we see we have more and more mass in the center, and our velocity will increase because there's more mass that is uh, uh, holding us. Then we'll cross the red line, and this mass will stay constant. And then we'll see what we saw before in our uh, solar system. The velocity will decrease. So what we expect to see in galaxies is that the velocity of stars is increasing until the edge of the uh, galaxy, the visible edge of the galaxy. And once we cross this edge, the velocity of the stars begins to fall down. Now, this, this is very, um, very basic. We can argue about the exact shape of, uh, of the red curve or the green curve and, and whatever. But what we expect to see, the bottom line, is that once you cross the visible border of the galaxy, you expect the velocities to drop. You're convinced? Yeah? OK, almost. So let's measure it. Let's take a galaxy. Let's estimate how much light we see. And let's measure the velocity of the stars as we go outside of the galaxy. So this is what we expect to get as we go further out from the galactic center. At the beginning, the velocity is, is uh, uh, rising. And then, when we reach the visible edge, the velocity of, of the stars begins to fall. This is what was actually measured. This is fine, more or less as we expected. <gasps> oh no! What, 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 what do you see here? It's a flat line. Now, th this, is, this is of course a PowerPoint graphic, right? It's uh, uh, nothing that is uh, publishable. But measurements like this were made on hundreds of galaxies. Just Google rotation curve, rotation curve and, and, and you get all of the papers. And in all of them, this is what you get. I mean, there are wiggles, obviously, right? And, and it's not straight, straight. But you keep getting that instead of the velocity dropping, the velocity is staying constant. So what, what, what does it mean that the velocity is constant? It, it means two things. Either we are moving at a velocity which is too fast for the mass that is inside, and then what will happen to us? We fly out. We are here. We are still here, so OK, we didn't fly out. So there has to be another solution. So what we believe happened is that there's more mass in the galaxy that we can actually see. So the mass that is holding the planet is not just what we see. It's, it's much more than, than uh, uh, the visible uh, light. And when I say visible light, it's not just the visible visible light. It's the full range of the electromagnetic radiation that we can measure. So these measurements uh, improved in the last uh, uh, 20 years, since the 70s. It's all started in the 70s. As we have uh, better measurements and, and got more and more information, but the situation is still the same. And the basic message is that, oh no, galaxies are spinning too fast. We cannot explain the velocity we're spinning at 
based on the matter we see in the galaxy. So either something is terribly wrong with our physics, and if you have a model or suggestion, I'm very much welcome to share it with me, or there's more mass that is hidden in there. Um, I'll show you just a, 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 real, um, a real graph showing the same. Um, so the dashed line, the lower one, is the estimation of the velocities just using the visible matter. And the uh, line above it with all the yellow and blue points, this, these are the measurements. So in this specific galaxy, you see that not only it, it's not even straight, it's, it's rising. And this is very surprising. And our conclusion is that there must be a hidden mass in there. And the nice thing is that using these rotation curves, we can also model what or how much mass is missing. Because we know what the velocity is and we know how much need to be there. And this is what we do. Now you might ask yourself, uh, well, how does this affect me? And uh, I did the math for you. And if you take the numbers for our own galaxy, our uh, Milky Way galaxy, we believe that there's a halo of dark matter, like a big cloud of dark matter in the center of the galaxy, all around it. And since we are uh, 26,000 light years away from the galactic center, uh, our velocity around the galactic center is 230 kilometer per second. Another trivia fact for you. However, if you take into account only the visible matter, the ordinary matter, our velocity should have been 180 kilometers per second. So this is, this is a pretty big difference. And we are at uh, 230, and, and here you got this terrifying plot shows you all sort of uh, dark matter, hello, models that all points to the same thing. There's probably more mass that than we can see. Um, this example, this is, was actually the second proof of dark matter throughout the timeline of dark matter uh, history. The first measurement that indicated dark matter existence was taken in the uh, 1930s um, by a scientist who I heard here was completely... Wasn't he? scientist who was uh, um, um, quite a character, named uh, Svicky, uh, and he measured the same effect not on galaxies, but on galaxy clusters. So you know there's the solar system, and we orbit the sun, and then there's the galaxy that we orbit the galaxy center, then there's galaxy clusters which orbit each other, so it's even a larger uh, structure, and, and this was also observed there. Okay, so we talked about the first method of um, weighing the galaxy. The second method is a, a much more modern method. It's a gravitation, gravitational lensing. This is how the cool people are doing um, uh, weighing uh, um, stuff in space. So you all know about space-time curvature, right? We say that everything here is just one curvature. And another way to imagine gravity is, is not you're just using the uh, Newtonian equation we just saw, it's also using the space-time curvature. So if you imagine that heavy bodies like this uh, uh, star there, the red star, they cause the, um, um, the surface of everything like to, uh, how's it called, uh, like to sunk in. Like uh, uh, if you take a big uh, uh, map, big sheet and you put some mass in it. So this is the same effect that heavy bodies do on our space-time curvature. And that means that the same way that uh, a ball will roll down on, on, the, on the sheet if there's something heavy in it, the same thing happened to all the masses in the universe as well. So it's like imagining that instead of something falling down because of gravity, it's kind of rolling in in the space-time curvature because of gravity. Now, if things with mass do it, in, in this uh, uh, general relativity view, also light will do it. 
So light, instead of moving in straight line, it will start to curve according to how much mass it passes. So here in this room, we are, uh, we are all uh, uh, fit and good looking, so no heavy masses. Light moves in straight lines. However, if something heavy would have been right here, it would cause the uh, space-time curvature to curve. And the light, instead of going straight, it would kind of curve, curve in, but like, like a lens, basically. So if we are making an observation in space, and this is the point uh, um, in the back, right here. This point here. And imagine that this huge mass wouldn't have been here. It's gone. You know, just watch and see, oh, it's there. However, it is here. And now the light is not moving in straight lines like it should have. It's curving. So without this mass, this uh, ray of light would move like this. And this ray of light would have moved like this. But because of this huge mass, it's, it's doing this curve. Now we're sitting here, we're looking at space, and we see this ray and this ray coming to us. So we kind of extrapolate back. It sounds very uh, scary, but, but this is what, what you do when you look at stuff. When you look at things that, with, with crazy lenses, it looks like things are crazy, even though they're not necessarily are. So if we trace back the lines we get, we do not see the mass here, we see it here and here. And if this is in an excellent symmetry, instead of seeing this mass, we would see a circle, right? because the, the ray coming from here would do like this, and also from the other side, all directions, so instead of seeing a point, we'll see a circle. Um, this is another cartoon showing it, more in a, a 3D way, same, uh, it's the same thing. So we're looking at something here, and the light is moving like this, and we see it as if it's coming from here. So if we know where the original thing is, and we look at the, this distortion, we can calculate what is the mass of the thing that is blocking our sight. So by watching something that's behind the huge mass, we can estimate the huge mass. mass. And uh, people do that. Um, this is a, a, it's an actual photo, it's not a, um, it was not edited, you, you, you see the ring, right? This is a, the effect of uh, general relativity, of this uh, gravitational lensing. And using the amount of lensing, you can calculate the mass of the object that is blocking your vision, and we do that. And again, when we repeat this kind of game for many, many objects, we see that a lot of mass is missing. Tens of uh, um, percents. Here's another uh, um, Chesh Cheshire cat. Again, it's real, it's, a, uh, it's an observation. And you can see here the nice uh, Einstein rings. The golden bullet for dark matter is uh, the bullet cluster, again, another clever uh, uh, naming. Uh, so what you see here is a collision of two galaxy clusters. So it's not a galaxy, it's a, it's a cluster of galaxies, it's a huge thing. Uh, it happened about 150 million years ago. And this photo is a combination of three measurements. All, all the white points are stars visible light. The red cloud is a gas measured by x-ray. And the blue is what you get if you do gravitational lensing calculations. So if you try to estimate where is the mass of what you see based on gravitational lensing. And those two things uh, um, um, collided, they passed through each other. And you can see some uh, very remarkable uh, uh, things here, because what this 
tells us, we see a clear separation of the different parts of the galaxy clusters. So if at the beginning, the gas and the, uh, uh, the mass were in the right place, after the collision, they separated. Because the gas interacted with itself as it is. But uh, the dark matter did not. So they passed through each other. And the blue circles kind of moved, um, moved on. And this is one of the strongest uh, proofs for uh, the existence of dark matter. Um, if you'll Google it, there's some uh, uh, animations showing it. Not, not real measurements, it was uh, um, um, extrapolated backwards, of course. So this is another proof of dark matter. It tells us that the mass or, or the heavy part of what we see is not what we see. It's someplace dark. So, great, many, many observations, but maybe there's something uh, seriously wrong with your detectors. Maybe. The last part in, in the puzzle that I'll show you is uh, um, the thing that ties everything together, and it has to do with the Big Bang. Heard of it, probably? So when it all started, um, I'll do a lot of hand-waving here. So, cosmic microwave background is an indication of the Big Bang. It's, it's, it's actually the strongest uh, evidence that supports the Big Bang. And at the beginning, at the very, very early universe, we had a soup of uh, uh, particles that after a few seconds became dark matter, as we believe, photons, and ordinary matter, which we call barium. So we had those three thingies flying around, dark matter, photons, and uh, uh, the matter. And at the early seconds, something great happened. So everything interacted with each other. The dark matter was kind of, was, was not very friendly, it did not interact a lot, but it was gravitationally uh, supporting everything. And the photons and the uh, regular matter just did the uh, heck of a party. They, uh, uh, combined and, 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 and disconnected and it all went on and on and on until at some point the universe got bigger and cooler and the, the matter became stable and the energy of the photons was not high enough for, for it to break the material that started to, uh, um, to become. So at this point we got all those photons just flying around having nothing to interact with. And if we roll everything fast forward until nowadays, we still see this radiation. It's uh, uh, called the cosmic microwave background. It was, uh, uh, it was a Nobel uh, Prize uh, um, discovery. And it all started by um, two scientists trying to do some radio measurement, and they kept getting this, uh, um, this noise, this noise. And they thought, well, maybe it's a, a, a pigeon, and they start, yeah, well, I'll be politically correct, they, they gently remove the pigeon from their telescopes. Um, but it turned out to be this uh, cosmic microwave background, which are photons that are um, with us since the uh, uh, very early universe, and, and they're actually an indication, the best indication we have for the Big Bang. They're everywhere, and we have uh, telescopes that can measure them. So um, it looks like this until uh, um, I don't know, several years ago it was considered to be completely flat, completely symmetric from all directions. But now we can look in more details and we can see that there's small structure in this uh, um, background when we look at the temperature, the energy of this radiation. It's uh, uh, very, very small. Is uh, um, the level is one part in a hundred thousand, so it's really, really small. You need to do very uh, um, clever analysis and pretty good detectors to measure it. But when you do this measurement and you check the structure, in it's this is all. It's it's amazing physics. It's uh, um, uh, it's it's not stuff that that I do, um, but it's it's it amazes me the amount of information that you can gain. So 
by looking at the at, at the structures or the way the cosmic microwave background looks like, you can reconstruct what was the relation between the three key players in the early universe, that is dark matter, photons, and, and regular matter. And what you discover is, first of all, that there is dark matter. You can estimate the, uh, the amount of it. You also discover that there's dark energy, which is a total uh, uh, um, different topic that we'll, we'll not get into it, but it's also uh, uh, there. So this tells us that there's dark uh, uh, matter, and in fact, when uh, uh, smart people use supercomputer to do a simulation of, of, of how everything started, they get that without dark matter, what we have now couldn't have become, because just by using the photons and the regular matter, the, the universe would not have been um, stable enough, and we would not have galaxies and, uh, and us and everything else. So this is another great uh, indication for the existence of, uh, of dark matter, and this thing actually um, ties everything together. So we have evidence for dark matter on many levels. We have it on galactic, on, uh, uh, on galactic level, on galactic clusters. We have it on a cosmological level. And right now, the best candidate is called dun, 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 the WIMP. Good name. It's an acronym for weakly interacting massive particle. It's a particle that rarely interacts, and it is massive. And the reason uh, the name WIMP was chosen is that a prior theory was called a massive compact halo objects, which is macho. <laughs> so we had machos and wimps. So the ma macho uh, uh, explanation is, uh, um, is 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 out. Uh, they tried to measure it, and it was not uh, was not successful. So this is just a, a joke about the uh, macho and the uh, um, the wimp. So we are looking for a wimp. Um, and I don't know how much time I've uh, blah blah. Five, five minutes. Five minutes. It felt like longer. No, I have five more minutes. Okay. Um, so now we are coming to my favorite part, which is how do you look for something you can't see? And the answer is using amazing detectors. <coughs> one method is uh, trying to generate dark matter in accelerator, like the one I worked on. Uh, in CERN using uh, uh, particle detectors. But what I do is a direct detection of WIMP or the dark matter particle. And in order to do it, we need to think what, what, what we know about this thing we know nothing almost about. So we know that we have dark matter in the galactic halo, because otherwise the rotation curves, etc., etc. We can estimate the density of dark matter using rotation curves and using all these uh, Big Bang uh, theories. We can estimate the way it behaves, again, using the Big Bang theories. We know how it should have interact with, uh, uh, with matter in, in the early stages of the universe. And using that, we can build a detector. Now, we also get a bonus for, uh, um, with, with the dark matter. We get something we call seasonal variation. As we fly, as our solar system flies through uh, um, the galaxy, it changes direction, right? So like this and like this. So in each direction, we have different wind uh, velocity hitting us. Once it's like this, and once it's like this. And in our detectors, we are uh, trying to measure uh, something like this. So I'll take a, a random example. Let's say the Xenon experiment that, I don't know, Accidentally, I'm, I'm a part of it. Um, and the xenon experiment is a big block of uh, xenon, liquid xenon. Xenon is a noble gas. We uh, operate it at 900 degrees, so uh, it's, it's liquid. It's heavy, it's clean. And what we do, we wait for um, dark matter particle to interact in it. So we're looking for very weak signatures of something that we do not expect to see. Uh, it's a phase program. We started with uh, 10 kilograms of uh, xenon. Uh, now we operate, I need to update this slide, now we operate xenon in one ton, which is one ton of uh, um, xenon. 
and in a couple of years we'll have xenon n ton, which is uh, um, five tons of liquid xenon. So th these are pretty big. Uh, it's all located in uh, the LNGS, the Grand Sasso Laboratory in Italy, about an hour drive from uh, Rome, near the uh, L'Aquila. We had a very rough earthquake there. It's a very beautiful place just under the mountain, and in under the mountain there's this huge laboratory uh, that we're a part of. Getting there is, uh, do you know Harry Potter? Of course you do. So you know there's the, the train station that he runs through the uh, wall in order to get to the um, two and third, uh, two and three quarters. So in order to get to the lab, you go on the highway, just a regular highway, it goes under the mountain, everyone goes. And all the physicists come to three and then kind of turn uh, sharply uh, right. And there's a, an entrance, very James Bond-like, um, entrance to the lab, which is uh, kind of hidden. So it's uh, very, very dramatic. You just try the highway and uh, uh, you're there. This is the Xenon experiment. You do not see it because it's in the big tank on the left side. You see just uh, a graphic of, of what's inside. It's filled with water, and inside the water there's another smaller um, um, chamber of holding the liquid xenon. All the stuff on the right side is the supporting system, the cryogenic, purification, uh, data acquisition, high voltage, etc., etc. Uh, this is the inner part of uh, the detector. So we use light signal to um, um, identify that something happened in the detector. And uh, this is all in here. These are the light detectors. This is another view of the detector from inside the big tank. You see there the cryostat just uh, um, being there. This is where the liquid zone will be. So, have we found dark matter? No, probably would have heard about it. We haven't found the uh, uh, dark matter, but we've made the uh, uh, um, upper limits. So the game right now in the market, there are a lot, a lot of dark matter detectors. You see all the lines there, there are results from different uh, dark matter detectors. And since we haven't made the discovery yet, we play a game of trying to set a limit of what models can we reject, because otherwise we would have seen them. And these are all the lines there. We're trying to get them lower and lower until we get a, um, a discovery. So the lower these lines are, the more models we reject. So just to uh, summarize, um, we have exciting science. The, the riddle of dark matter is huge. It's, it's amazing to think about how little uh, we actually know about the universe. We use state-of-the-art, very, very amazing detectors. We have many challenges, challenges in building them and operating them and data analysis, and it's, uh, uh, I, ha I haven't had time to talk about how the actual measurement is done, but it's very, very uh, challenging. And these are all made uh, possible thanks to a global, international collaboration. One university cannot pay for these detectors, so we are working in uh, uh, very large groups. And I hope that, uh, I don't know, in, in several years from now, um, dark matter will be a part of the standard model in, in some sort of a way. So, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And if you have questions, uh, yeah. If I understand well, uh, dark matter, you need dark matter to explain some phenomenon. Yeah. The, for the, the rotation of the Earth around the Sun, do you also need dark matter? Because this was explained by uh, scientist Birch, Birch before the dark matter was, was speaking about dark matter. So at this level, do you need it? So for just the solar system, it's, it's pretty small, so if there should be an effect, but it's nothing that we can uh, uh, measure. Um, the effects on, on the uh, galactic level is, uh, is stronger. This is the 230 kilometers per second versus the, the 180 kilometers per second. But in our own small uh, uh, neighborhood, then it's a very, very small effect.
Okay, maybe a last question. So um, you showed this bullet bullet point uh, picture, and so we saw that the the gas that interacts with itself stays in the middle, and that the dark matter goes through through itself. So it means that dark matter doesn't interact with itself. Also, does it mean that dark matter doesn't interact? Dark, dark matter does interact with itself. It's, it's very rare. It, it used to interact a lot with itself in the early universe when it had more energy, but now it's a uh, very, very, uh, very rare. The, the cross section is, is tiny. Yeah, so uh, thanks again. Thanks a lot.